World War II shaped the lives of a generation. The war broke families apart, brought communities together, and turned a depressed economy into an industrial machine. On the home front, citizens sold war bonds and collected scrap metal for the factories. Friends were made and lost as a generation of boys was sent into combat. Penn State Public Broadcasting invited those who lived this history to share their stories of World War II. My name, correct name, is Richard A. Swavely, and I served in the U.S. Navy from 1944 to 1946. December 7th, I was 15 years old. I was really at a dance hall. In those days, uh, there were dance halls around that just catered to young people, no alcohol or anything, but you danced to the music of uh, the big bands, great dance floors, and you danced to jukeboxes. And uh, I was at a, such a place, and uh, about 2 o'clock, they came out from the kitchen and said, come in here and listen to this, and it was the announcements coming through for the first time telling about the attack on uh, Pearl Harbor. On D-Day? Oh, that was, <laughs> yeah, that was June the 5th of 1944. Uh, uh, I was preparing to go in the Navy at that point. I, I actually left for uh, active duty on the 19th, and uh I was sitting in a dentist chair having a tooth pulled so and having my teeth going over because they told me don't let the dentists that are in the Navy do it because you might run into some guys that just want to take teeth out. And so that's where I was on D-Day. It was a very memorable day. Most nights I would have been up in the radio shack writing uh, letters or uh, listening to Tokyo Rose and just having a good time up there, drinking coffee with the guys. And uh, so I didn't want to do that that night. I went down to take a shower, and when I went down to take a shower, I was just coming out of the shower, getting uh, ready to get dressed, and the ship shook, lights went on and off, and... Everything was smoky and stuff. We had been hit by a kamikaze. The kamikaze took out about four decks, including the entire radio shack where I normally would have been at that time. It was pretty scary. I got dressed quickly, and I went up on deck and got up on the aft end uh, of the ship. And uh, we got up there just outside the hatch, and... We looked up, and there was a second Japanese plane coming in, so we were pretty shaken up. And that, you could see the guns on the wing tips firing at us, and fortunately, we didn't, none, none of the bullets struck close to us. And that plane uh, hit a king post, which is a vertical post mast on a ship, and it uh, spun off into the water with a 500-pound bomb on it, as we suspected the other one had that hit us. And that one didn't do any damage to the ship, really. We uh, lost 25 officers, and we had, uh, I mean, 25 uh, killed officers and enlisted men, and a total of 80 people uh, injured, uh, both officers and men. Uh, our ship was really in damaged condition, and as a result of that, I was not any good as a radio man, so they made me a communications yeoman for the ship, and uh, that led to other things uh, later on uh, then. I had served with the boat crew, though, uh, in the invasion of Okinawa back in April. This was August 13th that our ship was hit. Ernie Pyle was um, a journalist uh, or a, a war correspondent, they were called in those days, who covered the war in uh, in, Eng uh, in Europe, rather. And he was just a fabulous uh, uh, reporter for of the World War, and he was really 
uh, the GI's reporter. He, w- he was with them all the time. He lived with them. He b- went into battle with them and stuff. And this at Ayashima was the first effort. The war had uh, finished in uh, in April uh, or May. Well, it was essentially over anyway in the in Europe, and he was transferred from Europe, and this was his first uh, involvement in the Pacific theater of operations. And uh, unfortunately, it was his last. But he was really a well-respected well uh, reporter for the military. I didn't see Ernie Pyle. But I saw him buried. being buried. <laughs> Uh, that's that's right. Well, we uh, our ship was at Okinawa. Uh, I mean, in the Okinawa area, on March the 26th. The invasion of Okinawa was a- April the 1st of 1945, and uh, we had set up some artillery uh, batteries on uh, the Kuruma Rado Islands, and uh, we were held in reserve on. Uh, uh, April the first, we uh, and at that point I was a boat coxswain, may, may actually landing troops on beaches and so forth. And uh, the day after uh, the invasion of Okinawa, we uh, were asked to make a landing on Aishima, which is a s- small island to the south of uh, Okinawa, and our ship had on Ernie Pyle. I didn't know this until many years later, uh, but I have an article in my briefcase that uh, tells about how he was carried in on our ship. And it could he could have even been in my boat when I landed on, uh, on the attack on Aishima. But we had about 200 uh, people killed in that particular uh, attack. And... Uh, our ship went away and left us there for a couple of days. <laughs> and so we used to go out and uh, have the beachmaster signal uh, uh, various ships to see where we could get a dinner and a bunk overnight and stuff. But we went in and toured the island. And Aishima, uh, he, uh, Ernie Powell, when he landed, he had walked down uh, a road from about the middle of the island towards the south end of the island. And uh, as he was walking down there, uh, a sniper got him. And uh, they were, I heard uh, the officer that I was with, uh, heard that uh, he was going to be buried with about 200 soldiers that had been killed uh, that day when we got there, the day after he was killed. And so we walked down the same uh, road that he had walked down. And uh, there was a group behind us, maybe 100 yards or so, and they were fired on. (laughs) So we went down uh, to the grave site, though, and uh, they had built a wooden uh, box out of shipping crates for, or Colton, rather, for uh, Ernie Pyle. And... uh, He was going to be buried in the midst of these 200 soldiers that had been killed the day before in the attack on Aishima. And uh, we watched as the bulldozers made big, long slits in the ground, a couple hundred yards long and and stuff, and then they made uh, individual grave sites big enough for a person uh, uh, that was probably about six inches or uh, so deep so they could keep them separated. And they went down and laid them in one at a time, wrapped them in body bags and took off their uh, dog tags. And one went around near the neck of the soldier with the wire and uh, and the other dog tag was put on a chain uh, that the burial (laughs) Group. There was a group that was assigned a mortuary group, really. It was, and uh, they were 
keeping an accurate record of where each person was buried and uh, and we saw that happen and we saw them bring uh, the wood cra- uh, coffin in and Ernie Powell was built uh, buried right in the center of it. He was later moved from there to, he is entombed at, uh, on, on one of the islands, uh, uh, the Hawaiian Islands, I think near Pearl Harbor probably. Now there's a memorial to him. <laughs> Best story, uh, well, two stories I could uh, quickly tell you. During boot camp, I went through the first week of uh, mental tests and physical tests and everything, and uh, I ended up uh, that week was the only week I did anything outside of the swimming pool. I was made a swimming instructor all for the next seven weeks I was in boot camp, and I was there from in the swimming pool from 7.30 in the morning till 9 o'clock at night ate with Chip's company, didn't have to wear my boots. I was treated like royalty, and uh, it was a great effort. Uh, The other assignment I had at the end of the war as a result of being transferred out of the uh, boat group after the invasion of Okinawa, I was transferred into the radio gang to become what they call a striker, which is an apprentice in the Navy uh, term for an apprentice. And I couldn't take Morse code for anything, even though I knew it. But I I was probably ADD and could not concentrate long enough to really hear the signal. Anyway, uh, that's when I uh, left there and became a yeoman, a communications yeoman, when the, our ship was hit. Then... I was. We came back to, and our ship was decommissioned in San Francisco, and I had a 30-day leave, and I reported back to Shoemaker, California. They liked me out in the West Coast, and uh, I was looking for a good job, and I talked my way into uh, a job, uh, a yeoman's job. Uh, the yeoman's job was in the disciplinary barracks uh, where they handled nothing but general court-martial prisoners and really people that were in serious trouble and could get anywhere from 8 to 32 years sentence for all kinds of activities. And I was assigned to the disciplinary barracks. I had regular office hours for the last six months I was in the service went on leave every weekend in Frisco and uh, at a dude ranch where we had a lot of fun. But I was uh, doing classification work on general uh, general court-martial prisoners, determining whether there were hardships in the family uh, that was caused by their incarceration, and also uh, uh, planning uh, what kind of assignments they would get in uh, while they were in the uh, prison. And uh, also uh, we worked on their discharge or their uh, restoration or clemency uh, that they might get uh, when they came uh, in front of a board that evaluated them for release or from prison or discharge from the Usually it was a discharge with a bad conduct discharge. It was very hard to get a a dishonorable discharge. I mean, they just didn't give many of those out, but bad conduct discharges we uh, were quite frequent. Almost everyone got that. So, so that was an interesting period. Uh, I played basketball every noon time. Weekends we went to a dude ranch uh, out in, uh, outside of San. Uh, San Jose, or else we went into uh, San Francisco and listened to the big bands, which were often playing live in there. And we did some other things, hit some of the bars and good eating places, and really lived it up. 